Okay, thank you so, for the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm sorry if you were expecting Sarah Taylor. <laughs> she looks a lot prettier than I do. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, this talk is about invasive species, climate change and disease, the elephant in the forest. That's her title. <laughs> but we'll come back to what the elephant might mean. Um, so it's really, really thinking about some of the issues around biosecurity, the precautions that we need to take to prevent introduction and spread of organisms, range of threats that uh, British forests are, are facing. And if there's one lesson, it's don't make the same mistakes as we have. Um, looking at pathogens, but also mammals and uh, plants as well, not just the sort of insects and, and uh, diseases of fungal sorts or other. And then we've got to interact with this thing called climate change, with the assumption that some of these problems are only going to get worse. Okay. Right. I'll try. Right. That's better. Yes. So we'll, we'll start with some of the easier ones in one respect. Um, Grey squirrel, uh, introduced to Britain in various times between 1870 and 1920. And why is it a problem? Well, it's just a problem in biodiversity terms, displacing red squirrels. Uh, both through direct competition and through the spread of a, 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 a squirrel pox. Uh, but it's also, by many forest owners, seen as the biggest single threat to growing broadleaf trees in Britain. You put 10 or 15 years into getting the damn trees established, squirrels come along and just wreck them by bark stripping. And there are many estates which just really have given up on the idea that they can grow quality timber as a, as, as a consequence. Um, so we've tried various forms of control, uh, bounties on squirrel tails, um, so warfarin, of course now banned, various forms of squirrel traps. Uh, trying to hit them with cars is not very effective. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfying, if, but, but not, not as a control measure. Um, Deer, we, we've heard about, and yes, we've got deer problems as well. And major changes, again, in biodiversity terms, the structure and composition of the woods, and major costs to foresters. But there, there is at least some hope with the deer that there are ways in which we, you know, estates were managed to keep the numbers under check and to get regeneration going again and to to see also where you can, that the biodiversity species can come back through control. So I'm a little bit more optimistic about deer than I am about grey squirrels. But then there's what are the next mammals coming in? Um, we've now got wild boar re-established, escapes from boar farms, two or three um, populations now established, and they've been declared native, so in effect, guerrilla reintroductions um, and frankly, they're getting out of control in the Forest of Dean. The population is rising rapidly despite Forestry Commission's efforts to, um, to manage the numbers. So I think we're going to have a wild dip boar problem very shortly. And what will be the next mammal that comes across? Um, I'm slightly worried about a raccoon dog seems to be the one that's spreading eastern Germany at the moment. So... We've got some problems with mammals, but maybe we can deal with them. Invasive plants, again, one you're very familiar with, rhododendron, taking out lower levels <coughs> through shading in woods, uh, making woods inaccessible. Carrier phytophthora. Uh, when it, that first appeared, I, I was actually quite hopeful. I thought, well, at last there's something, a reason that everyone will get on board with of controlling rhododendron. Um, didn't work, but... There we are. So costly con control uh, and a problem both for foresters and conservationists. And then there are other non-native plants which may not be a problem in terms of 
um, forestry in terms of timber production, but certainly from a conservation perspective, we, we need to sort of think about what we're going to do with them. And in particular, I'll highlight high, uh, Himalayan balsam, uh, which has been spreading along particularly rivers and stream sides, forming very dense stands and get, eliminating a lot of the native flora underneath it. And worryingly, it seems to be starting to spread up away from the watercourses as well in a number of sites. So we're starting to get concerned about that one. Insect pests, both direct damage and as vectors for disease. So things like the gorillas beetles, which we think are involved with the spread of acute oak decline, uh, the scolitis beetle that was involved with spread of Dutch elm disease, various beetles on spruce, and then insects which could be potential human hazard in <coughs> woodland, and we've now got oak processionary moth established in Western London, and um, really I can't see it being tempting to hold it under control, but I'm not convinced they'll be we'll be able to, uh, mainly because the main method of control is pesticide spraying, which is not good if you're trying to do this in Richmond Park, which is an SAC for various uh, rare and threatened beetles. So uh, I don't think we're going to have trouble there. Keeping new insects out. I mean, we're all looking at emerald, emerald ash borer working its way towards us. Are we going to be able to keep it out? Can we keep gypsy moth out? Um, is there adequacy of port inspections? They're very good at picking things up, but it's the number of containers coming in that are not necessarily inspected that is going to be the problem, and also the potential for natural spread across the channel. It's only 20 miles or so, nearest point. Strong wind could blow an insect, insects over in a very short time. Diseases and syndromes. Um, there was a stage when conservationists in Britain were very smug. They were looking at all these diseases affecting these big conifer plantations and saying, there, we told you so, grow things uniform, monocultures, and you'll get diseases. It doesn't happen in semi-natural woodland, does it? <laughs> well, Dutch elm disease should have told us that it does. Um, Phytophthora remorum came over, threat, seen as a threat to oak. Fortunately, it hasn't proved to be that serious a problem for oak and beech. But it did prove a problem once it spread onto larch for the commercial forestry side. And then meanwhile, we were getting acute oak decline, which we're still not totally sure what it is, but it seems to be a combination of a bacteria-like organism, uh, which may or may not be being spread by the agrillus beetle, but the beetle is strongly associated with where the outbreaks are occurring. So there's lots of circumstantial evidence that it's, it's involved, even if it's not actually spreading the, the, the causal agent. Um, and we've got ash dieback working its way through our woods. So what's the next tree that's going to get hit? All that's already being hit, juniper's being hit. Um, as far as I know, nothing is yet hitting small-leaved lime, but it might be by the time I get back. Are there any lessons we can take from this? Well, I think one of the things that we need to be aware of is to avoid complacency, because if you take Dutch elm disease, sudden oak death, or acute oak decline, if you like, we, we sort of thought we understood what was going on with Dutch elm disease. It'd been around since the 1930s. It's not that serious a problem. 1960s suddenly changes its character because of a, the fungus hybridizes or changes or whatever and becomes a major problem. Sudden oak death thought was going to be a problem. Well, it's not a problem with the oak. Changes its host ca capability and moves on to large. Uh, acute oak decline, for a long while we didn't, we thought it was just the, the chronic oak decline that we were familiar with and then noticed the trees were dying in two or three years rather than hanging on for 40 or 50. And we need to document the effects. We've been looking to try and 
Because of ash dieback, we've looked back to see, well, what do we know about how the effect of Dutch elm disease was? And we found very little data really on it, apart from you know, documents of its spread, but not on, the, for example, what effect the changes were in the woods where it died out. I think a second lesson is most of these things have generally been in the country long before they're detected officially. Um, so we've got to try and get better at picking things up early when there might still be a chance of controlling them. Otherwise, sanitation felling has not really proved that effective, uh, except in there have been one or two cases. Brighton still has elms, but largely because it's surrounded by an area that doesn't have any elm in it. Um, and they've managed to keep them, but generally sanitation felling for other diseases hasn't worked. Another thing that we've come to realize is that the final death of the trees is often not from the thing that starts it off. You know, the ash, ash dieback weakens the tree and then it's our malaria that comes in and kills it, or that the acute oak decline weakens the tree and it's a drought or a windstorm that finally kills the thing off. So that again may complicate how we view things. But what appears to be a minor problem may be just the last straw that leaves the thing eventually going. And I, so ideally, we need to try and keep these things out. Uh, but the high cost is involved in that is something that we're still coming to grips with. Now, just the climate change interaction. Well, trees are more likely to be put under stress. Um, they're more sus susceptible to impacts, and the impacts may be wrongly assigned. When we're looking at trees dying, well, is it climate change itself, or is it the effect of climate change interacting with the disease? Unfortunately, climate change seems to be benefiting pests and diseases more than it's benefiting some of our native species. So that, for example, we're getting reduced winter mortality of mammals, such as deer, so we're getting more deer problems. Um, we're getting species able to spread north. Uh, the fact that uh, oak processionary moth is now established in Britain, whereas previously it was a southern Europe, more of a southern European species. The fact if we get introduction of new tree crops, which on the one hand is being talked about as one of the ways of making forestry in Britain more resilient, the risk is that we'll bring in some new diseases as well. Well, ways forward, at least there is increasing recognition that tree health is a problem. It's, it's got through to politicians at last. Um, that doesn't mean they'll do anything, but at least they are making noises about it. There's a need for more coordinated responses across the various departments, and there's starting to be some sort of signs of that. We do now have a sort of chief plant health officer who can look across departments. As Tim said earlier on, we've got to get more better at being proactive and predictive about where these threats are going to come, and importantly, to bring the public on board. And I think there are a number of public reactions that we can see over the years in response to some of these threats. A large chunk of the public often just ignore them. They don't see plant health as an issue or the need to take action. Second sort of awareness is that they're aware of the disease but actually oppose the action because it perhaps, for example, it involves killing mammals or clearing rhododendron. Uh, which has attractive flowers. There are places in Snowdon where you can get bus tours to go and look at the rhododendron flowering in the, in the summer. Um, people might accept that there's a problem in principle but take issue with the actions, so large-scale fellings or the consequences of restriction on access if work is going on. We close Whiten Woods for a week each year to shoot the deer and we have joggers climbing over the fences to run around the wood while this is happening. So far, they've all got out. <laughs> uh, the public can sometimes actually be, be a little too optimistic of our ability to deal with these things. Okay. 
um, they assume threats can be controlled and that no change will happen. And again, I think with Ash Dieback, we've got to prepare people for the fact that there could be quite large landscape changes going on. More positively, we can get people involved through citizen science. And that has been successful in, particularly with Ash Dieback, of getting people to detect where the disease had spread to. But also it's been useful in picking up another of uh, a couple of outbreaks of um, chestnut blight, which we weren't other wouldn't otherwise have been aware of. So conclusions, the problems aren't going to go away. We might as well get ready for the next wave of pests that are coming in. Um, most the current methods of biosecurity and control, I think, can slow spread but seldom guarantee complete safety. This shows the, the detection increase for ash dieback starting in the green areas over on the right as you're looking at it early on, the blue and then the red where it's the most recent years. As I say, I'm not sure if that's genuine spread of the disease or just spread of awareness as to where it had got to. And I think we've got to get better at learning to live with the problems and risk management. But the elephant in the room that I see is actually what is the cost of dealing with all these issues? And some very preliminary figures that have, are being worked on for Ash Dieback end up in the billions if you take into account ecosystem service losses as well. And if those are real and can be justified, then perhaps it really does justify some fairly stringent biosecurity measures and the costs involved with that. Because the cost, for example, of local authorities having to fell uh, ash trees by roadsides for safety reasons alone is quite horrendous. So, yeah, thank you.